guys and welcome back to another music review. So today we're doing, well, context. Pete Townsend just released a huge box set of all his live albums, seven albums, 14 discs. Uh, it's a pretty big set. I think pretty limited quantity too. It was already sold out on his site by the time I learned of it and I knew of it pretty quickly. So must be very limited copies. Uh, so I don't physically have a copy in my hands yet, although I'm trying to procure one, <laughs> but anyway, uh, that said, all the tracks are on Spotify, so I can still review this thing right away. But nobody is binge listening to 14 discs back to back to back to back to back. So what I'm doing is I'm gonna re uh, review each individual album one by one as separate reviews. So I think that makes a lot more sense. Um, instead of trying to tackle the entire set as a whole, that seems just like a Herculean effort and like, how could you even compare some of these to some of the others? That's not fair, I don't think. So I think doing each album individually is a much smarter call. So the first one in the set is the, let me scroll up, the Deep End Live Brixton Academy uh, performance from November 1st and 2nd, 1985. Now, this is not the short and abridged version of the album. This is the full set, because I know there is that Deep End Live version that is just one disc, and it's a very abridged track listing on that. No, no. This is much better. Very interesting track list, I must admit. Even before I listened to anything, I was looking at that going, those are some interesting choices. All right, let's go for it. So, we're gonna go through one by one, and then I'll rank it. So, first track on here is Marianne with the shaky hand. Now let that sink in, this is 1985! He has dug back deep for that one! He went back to Who Sellout for that one! And not only that, but he did this as a solo acoustic track. Yeah, that's a way I never thought I would hear him perform that particular song, but not only that, but as an opener to a show? Wow, I have to admit, that's a ballsy move. I respect it. Granted, at the same time, knowing what the original track sounded like, I'm like, I think I still prefer the original, but that's okay. It's still nice to hear it and experience it in a completely different setting, a completely different way. And such an unexpected song to be brought back from the ether. I'm like, all right, I love to see it. I do love to see it. So second track in, get this, second track of the show. Won't get fooled again. <laughs> like, all right, again, that is a choice. I'm so used to hearing that towards like the end of a show that hearing at the beginning is like mind blowing. It's also completely bizarre hearing it without the signature adultery scream <laughs> towards the end of the song, too. But, I mean, it's Pete doing it, not Roger, so we cannot fairly compare there, uh, nor are we meant to. Uh, it starts out first verse as an acoustic, but then the rest of the band comes thundering in at the end of that first verse. Uh, it's interesting hearing it with, like, a very prominent horn section on it, too. I'm just like, all right, this is different, but good different, you know? There's also a little diversion in the middle of the song, too, that almost for like a second or two, it sounds like it wants to turn into My Wife, but it doesn't. It stays in the same song, but I'm like, ooh, I wonder if that was just by chance or if that was intentional, because I feel like that's intentional. It's on the same album and everything, so I'm like, I, I don't know, I got chills when I noticed it, and I caught it first time through listening to that as well, but... Yeah, definitely blown away. It's just like, ha, huh, he really went in with this set list and was just like, I am gonna knock him dead with this one from the word go, and yes, he did. So the third track on the album, again, interesting choice that I was not expecting, but throwing it back to the days of Empty Glass with A Little Is Enough, and I'm like, okay, you know, out of the tracks on Empty Glass, if you asked me what I thought would make it into a live show, I don't think that would be in my top 10 guesses. <laughs> but I was like, all right, kind of interesting. Uh, it starts out a little rough. Like, I mean, it's been a few years since that album came out to when this performance was. So vocally, not quite as solid as he was when the album happened. But on the other hand, 
On the other hand, the instrumentation on this one, though, I actually, I think I prefer this live version of it to the album version, believe it or not. As sacrilege as that sounds, I'm gonna admit, the album version, I was never a huge fan of that track. But this live one, seeing how transformative that the band makes this, I'm like, I think this is the first time in my life I've actually been excited hearing this song. I'm like, okay, I I respect that. I respect that greatly. <laughs> so the fourth track in is Secondhand Love. And I'm like, ooh, we got some White City action going on. All right, we love to see it. And this song is just a total groove, no matter what. Album version, live version, doesn't matter is a whole ass mood <laughs> and actually this is another one where i feel like this live version adds to it i mean the album version is great to begin with but it does just add an extra energy to it that's not there in the studio recording and i'm like ooh, i i'm really into this one surprisingly so i'm like okay gets my stamp of approval so the next track in is Pete covering That's Alright Mama, that Elvis track. Well, actually, <laughs> before any neckbeards come in my comments going, well, actually, Elvis was not the first person who did that song. Yeah, I know, I know. But Elvis is the one that everyone knows the song for, so shut up. But anyway, regardless, I wasn't looking at the track list as I was playing through the album the first time. So I hit this, I practically gave myself whiplash, I was like, I'm sorry, what is happening right now? Wait, 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 Pete's doing this song? I'm so used to hearing, like, various members of the Beatles cover this song that my brain actually kind of more associates them with it than anything, but all of a sudden, here's Pete doing it out of nowhere, and I'm like, wait, no, and, like, I got laugh face the first time I listened to it just because of the unexpectedness of it. But upon second listen, I'm like, this isn't that bad, actually. It's a pretty okay cover of it. Not my favorite in the world, but I mean, it's it's all right. I didn't even mean to make the pun. I did. I swear to God, I didn't mean to. That just worked out. But I mean, it's just it's all right. It's all right. Um, it starts out with just he and a guitar, and eventually drums come in, a harmonica. And it it fleshes out slowly. It blossoms as the song goes on. But it's like, I mean, as a curiosity. As a novelty, it's definitely worth listening to at least once, but I'm like, eh, kind of like, I guess if, like, he's trying to do not only his own stuff, but also musical influences that inspired him to become a musician, that makes sense that that would be there. But if that's not what he's going for, then I am honestly confused right now. But I'm pretty sure, given a bunch of the other songs that come after this one in the track list, in the set list. That has to be what he's going for, right? I would assume, anyway. Okay, so the next track in is Behind Blue Eyes, and honestly, this is a trip hearing Pete sing it. Even though It's not the first time that I've ever heard Pete sing this as a solo track, but when it's a song that you so inextricably link with Roger Daltrey's voice, it's always gonna be interesting hearing it in a different way than the one we're all so used to. But I feel like even though, vocally, it may not have the same power behind it that it does when Roger sings it, it has an added depth of soul to it. Because Pete, being the one who wrote the song, he knows the intention better than anybody. So, of course, he's literally living, breathing, feeling that song. So it comes out and hits differently when he does it. And that, again, the transformative nature of it all. I just love that. I, I really like it. Um, it starts out very, not quite entirely acoustic. There's some other stuff going on. But it does eventually explode into the rest of the song. And it's pretty great. There's, like, additional instruments in there that were not in the original. That in this one, it's like, oh, that's kind of all right. It's a nice addition, like the wind chimes kind of effect in there, the, like almost sounding like a magic wand or something going by. It, I don't know, it adds to it in a way that, you know, just it tickles my ear, I guess. But I, I like it. I like it. 
So the next track in is The Shout, which is one of the tracks that was on one of the Scoop albums that Pete released, which if you're unfamiliar with them, there are like unreleased bits and bobs that never made it to albums that he held on to, so they made it on to those. Uh, this was one of those. It's another one of those songs where it's like, eh, it's just, it's okay. Um... <laughs> It was kind of a choice to put it there, but I guess it was one of those things where when looking at the songs around it, I guess he needed something to dip the energy for a little bit, give himself a chance to like recharge the batteries so he'd be all ready to go for the next uh, songs in because yeah, it makes up for it, it balances out, but this particular one, I don't know, for me, a little bit of a snoozer, probably gonna skip that particular one in the future if I'm being real. But I have to admit, I'd forgotten all about the track The Shout, and it also unlocked this memory of mine of like early 2000s Who fandom online. The Shout was a message board, I don't know if it's still around or not, but I knew that before I actually knew the song by years, so <laughs> kind of interesting little thing. I'm probably going to check after I finish recording these if that's still around, because I honestly don't know, but anyway. Okay, so the next track in is a cover of Harlem Shuffle, not to be confused with Harlem Shake, that is a very different song, but, um, but yeah, Harlem Shuffle by Bob and Earl, if I remember right. Very interesting hearing Pete do a cover of that, I'm not sure if... I'm trying to think if I heard him do a cover of that elsewhere. I want to say maybe one other time, but I can't place where. But regardless, very cool hearing him do it. Of uh, the entire disc one on this album, arguably this might be my favorite one on there. It's the one I've gone back to the most times out of all the tracks this far, which is pretty cool. But um, yeah, this one, I mean, it's something pretty different. And, you know, just... To shake it up, just to have something unique, um, especially for a live performance where you really never know what you're going to get. Very, very cool seeing him do, well, hearing him do this. So the next track in was a new one to me, and this one is a cover of Barefootin', which I, again, I'm not familiar with the original, so I cannot compare it to the original on this one. But um, it's another, like, upbeat tempo, kind of a dancey tune. Um, liked this one a lot too and just again just for variety of stuff that I'm not accustomed to hearing come out of Pete I'm like all right actually I'd love to hear him do a lot more of this kind of stuff personally really like this one so then a real interesting one comes into the mix so Pete does after the fire which I mean I realize he wrote the song I've always known that but I am so used to it being a Roger Daltrey solo song and like arguably probably like the biggest hit he ever had in his solo career that I was like, oh wow, this is weird. Well, it's not the only time I've heard Pete do it either. I've heard demos of him singing it, but I don't think I've seen him do it live other than this. So I'm like, ooh, okay, all right. I didn't realize he actually went there with it until now. And all right, I mean, my brain still really just wants it to be Roger. There's not many things in Roger's solo catalog that I would defend. Pete's is by far and large the best out of the Who's solo output. John and Twistle a close second, but then Keith and Roger kind of fall off, unfortunately. I love them, but I mean, facts are facts, but <laughs> Pete's is the best. So doesn't surprise me that Roger's biggest solo hit was written by Pete. Shocker, right? So Pete has every right to do the song. But it doesn't mean that it's not weird hearing him sing it after like 20 years of listening to Roger do it. <laughs> Longer if you're an older fan, but anyway. Yeah, I mean, it's okay, but my brain's just going, no, no, this is Roger's song, leave it alone, even though I, I logically know better, but it is what it is, so... So the next track in is really special because, ooh, we have a surprise guest on stage now. Dave fucking Gilmore. Like, oh my god. So we have two guitar gods on stage at the same time. If there is video of this, I need to see it. Somebody drop a link down in the comments if it exists. But 
They did Love on the Air, which just... <laughs> mind blown. Was not expecting that going into this. I just... Every time I've played it through, I still have a moment of, oh my god, like fangirling, even though, admittedly, I'm a Roger Waters girl, but I still have a great appreciation for Dave Gilmore as well, cannot lie, so. So the next track in is another big surprise on here, because another special guest, and any Who fan will recognize the name John Rabbit Bundrick from a lot of Who tours as the keyboardist. I actually didn't know he had a solo career outside the Who. And the song Midnight Lover apparently is one of his, and now I'm like, damn, that song slaps! I'm like, I I apparently need to go check out his solo repertoire now, too. I, I didn't know existed until listening to this album, but yeah, this one, again, if, if you're in the same boat, didn't know this existed, definitely check this out. It's really cool. So the next track in, we've got another David Gilmore song in here, and Pete does the introduction mentioning an interesting guitar technique that Gilmore uses in this song that, in his opinion, sounds like the one in uh, Leave Them Gives Alone, uh, Another Brick in the Wall. Uh, but he referred to it the other way. I would counter that and say, I don't think it sounds so much like that as I think it sounds more like the one used in Run Like Hell, but I digress. Still, the song is Blue Light. It's a long song, but oh my god, it's badass, though. Just like, start to end. It does not feel like a nine-minute track, but here we freaking are. Just, again, like, if there's a video of this show, it seems like it would be such an incredible thing to have the visual to go along with the audio of this. Just, oh my god, it's so so oh, cool! So after those last few tracks, Pete had a hard time trying to figure out what to follow that up with, so he follows it up with a cover of I Put a Spell on You. Like, again with like this super unexpected tracks you would never expect to hear out of Pete fucking Townsend. I'm like, ah, holy shit! And just the vocals are so raw and primal, and while some might argue in places that it almost sounds shaky, weak, or something, I'm like, no, 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 I think it, he's embodying the actual vibe of the song, or at least what his interpretation of the song is, but, oh, but the guitar work on this one will make your toes curl, it is so good, just, oh, damn! Damn, it's good! Hmm. So then rounding out the last track on disc one is just I'm One from Quadrophenia, and it's basically just Pete and his guitar, little dabblings of other instruments coming in around the edges, like a little bit of bass, like a little bit on the keyboards around the edges, but it's mostly just Pete, his guitar, and that's pretty much it. It is exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, I think it's more or less the way that he still performs the song to this day, um, with a few exceptions here and there, but still, still, I mean, it's solid. Uh, it's, again, nothing that we haven't heard elsewhere, but it's still nice to hear it. It's nice to see the inclusion of Quadrophenia stuff, so. Uh, in terms of ranking disc one, I mean, I'll rank disc one, disc two, and then do an average to do my album scoring. Uh, solid eight for disc one. It's pretty damn good. So the first track on disc two is an old blues standard, Drift and Blues, that he does a cover of. And this one, again, I wasn't familiar with, so I had to Google who originally did it and all that, but Still, again, just for the sake of having some variety to shake things up instead of it being like the same handful of songs over and over and over again, I think this is a really cool format for Pete. I wish he'd do more solo tours like this, but I don't think he will nowadays, but it's nice that we have it documented that it happened even once, but I enjoyed it. So the next track in is Magic Boss, or at least an acoustic ver uh, version of it anyway, which is kind of cool. Um, it's weird hearing it without John Entwistle's bass run throughout the whole thing driving it, but it still works though, and clearly it's a fan favorite, as you'll hear, through all the fan interaction with it and just, in general, the way they react to it. Just, 
you can't miss how much that song is beloved. And it's always been a fan favorite, which made it that much funnier that John Entwistle hated playing the song live so much. So in this particular version, we cut out the middleman because he's not even a part of this show. Therefore, no problem. But it is a good version of it. I wasn't sure how I would feel initially going into it hearing an all acoustic version, but oh, it actually surprisingly does work. So the next song is yet another cover, and this one is Save It For Later, which another one that I was not familiar with the original track. I have a lot of homework to do now, don't I? But anyway, uh, this one, especially without knowing the source material for me, was just kind of... Meh. But I mean, if you know the original song, you might feel differently about it, but I'm just coming from where I'm coming from on this as somebody who does not know the original song. I was like, eh, well... Let's get on to the ones that I do know, but anyway, yeah, this one was a little bit of a snooze fest for me. I'm going to be honest with you, but that's just my opinion. You don't have to agree with it. So the next track in is Eyesight to the Blind from Tommy, and I found it interesting that it is neither performed in the way like it was on the album, nor in the style from the film. Uh, actually, according to the dialogue at the end of the track, he said... We're nothing if we're not authentic, which tells me that they probably did it in the style of the original, original track, because this was the one song on Tommy, if I'm not mistaken, that was a cover song. So that's kind of interesting, and again, I've never actually heard that original version of it, but something tells me that it was probably in a very similar, if not identical, style to how it was performed here. So, it's one of those things where just trying to get it out of my head of what I'm used to it sounding like for so many years and just accepting it sounding different. Probably gonna take a little time for me to warm up to, like, as for right this moment, I'm a little like, mm, on that because of it, but that's because of my own naivete in not knowing the original, original version, just truth be told there. So next one in is another cover, this one of a Miles Davis song called Walkin', and this one is instrumental, so no singing on this one, very brass heavy, but ooh, the intro of this one, I honestly mistook it for the intro to Face the Face, actually, which is on here, so I feel like this may have been intentional to have placed it there and to have placed it before it, to show kind of like his musical inspiration there for the other, maybe, or maybe it was just by chance. I don't know. This is me just spinning speculation here, but damn, that one was another one that is just like to curl your toes worthy of this one. Just everything about it is like stop you in your tracks. Like, damn, all right, can we hear more stuff like this? This is actually pretty badass. So the next track in is Stop Hurting People, which is from the All the Best Cowboys Have Chinese Eyes album, which is my favorite of Pete's solo albums, so it's exciting hearing stuff from that played live. I wasn't expecting this one to be played live, since, I mean, the studio version of it, like, the way the vocals are on it for the main part of the song, not the chorus, but just, like, the verses, it's almost robotic in its delivery, so hearing Pete actually, like, sing those same words, it's a different experience, and I'm just like, I'm not sure how I feel about this one yet. Again, maybe after more time and more listens, I'll warm up to it, but initially I'm like, no, I, I think I prefer the album version on this one, but it's still cool to hear it live. I think I'm more surprised that Slit Skirts is not in this lineup. I would have expected that, of all things, to be a live track here. Maybe it is on some of the other discs, I don't know yet, but, um... Uh, for this particular show, given that there's a couple songs from Chinese Eyes, there's a couple songs from White City, I'm really surprised they omitted that one. But I guess for time constraints and such, certain things couldn't be included, and that's okay. But I would have liked to have seen it. So the next track is the other one from the Chinese Eyes album that made it into the set list, and this one is The Sea Refuses No River. Now, by comparison to the last track, this one is actually very faithful to the album version, although they did take liberties with the guitar solo in the middle of the song, but at the same time it didn't detract from it in doing that, it just made it different in a good way. But this, this is how you do it right. This, oh my god. 
absolutely incredible rendition of this song where I'm just sitting here like, I feel like I didn't breathe for about five minutes listening to that. It was so incredible. So the next track in is a cover of Boogie Stop Shuffle, and initially I thought this was like an overglorified eight minute long drum solo, but slowly more and more instruments do come into this one, and again, even if it were nothing but drums, I over here would not be complaining, because you know I love drummers the most, so I'm over here like, oh, I think I listened to this on loop an ungodly number of times in a row. Um, Nobody look at my last FM chart, okay? Okay, but uh, <laughs> it's almost embarrassing how many times in a row I listen to it for reasons. So, <laughs> But oh my god, this track is just breathtaking in every sense of the word. I cannot rank this highly enough. Like, if the song alone could be at a 10 out of 10, it would be an 11. Like, this is honestly just... Possibly out of disc two might be the fave. I don't know. There's some other strong contenders on here, too, so I don't even know So the next track in was always going to get top marks from me just for being the nature of what it is Being what it is so he did face the face from white city Which is my favorite song off of there and arguably one of if not my favorite solo Townsend song period so I mean, it's pretty tight race between that and slit skirts, I know, I know, but regardless, oh, it's good. It is weird, though, hearing the verses sung by a woman instead of by Pete, like it is on the album, but I mean, there was women in the song on the album, too. I feel like they may have flipped the roles a little bit, although they weren't doing the the chorus exactly in the either. They, they were in there, though, but... It's it's interesting hearing it changed up, but at the same time, it does not in any way, shape, or form detract from it. It's actually really cool hearing it like this, but it does throw you when you're trying to sing along to it, and you're used to the pacing that Townsend uses for it when he does it in the studio version, but then you hear it here, it's like, oh, this is entirely different, but not bad, though. Not bad at all. So the next track is, of course, the fan favorite. You can't have Pete performing without Pinball Wizard. Of course, which I mean, given like my favorite Who thing is Tommy, so of course I'm here on board with this, and it's pretty much just he and his guitar. That's it. No other band, just those two. Which again, it's not the first time we've heard him do that, but it's always still, in my opinion, really cool to see it. So I appreciate that it was here. I appreciate that it was done in this fashion. And it sounds like the crowd was absolutely 100% of the way there, too, because they're singing along, they're doing the callbacks and everything, and the song, it's just so damn cool. So damn cool. So the next track is another one from, um, from White City, and it's Give Blood, which is my other favorite track off, off of that album. So I'm like, ooh, okay, love to see this. And very faithfully done to the album as well, I must admit. Uh, he mentions in between songs that the album is about to come out the very next day. So I was like, oh, these cool people got a preview the night before it's released. That just makes it that much cooler to me. But it's a very, very, very good live rendition. He brings Dave Gilmore out again to play on this one. Just, I'm like, now I need to check the liner notes and see, did he play on the album? Because maybe he did and I just never knew this. And hey, another Phantom crossover yet again. But anyway, yeah, they could have closed the show out here, but there's still one more track. So the last track on the album in the show is a cover of Night Train, which I didn't think I knew by title till I heard it. Then I was like, oh, that song. Oh my God, that's badass that they did that. And what a great upbeat song to end the show on is something like that, that everybody knows, everybody loves, everyone's going to have a good time with and high energy. That's honestly awesome to me. That is a great way to end out a show. Now... Averaging up the scores of disc 2, it only brings us to a 6.5 out of 10. But averaging together the scores from both discs, that brings us to a solid 7 out of 10 for this album. I highly recommend it. It's really good, especially as like the first solo output live album that's in this collection. Really good, solid effort, and it just, it captures a snapshot in an era in time. I mean, I suppose they all do, but this, this particular one feels 
especially iconic to me. So, anyway. Those are my thoughts on this one. Take them or leave them. So as usual, you know what to do. If you like this video, go ahead and give it a like. If you're not already and you'd like to be, click subscribe. Hit that notification bell icon so you never miss an upload. Leave comments down below. Make sure you're following my social media accounts, my Facebook fan page, my Twitter, my Instagram, my eBay, my Reddits, everything and more. It's all down below. And if you like what you hear on this channel and you'd like to help support it, the donation link, as always, is down in the description. Get your name on the end card for a month from the time of donating. Anyway, guys, till next time, see ya.